Okay, great. So um, thank you to our morning speakers for getting things started. Uh, so far this morning, we've been just kind of talking about the big picture of groundwater in California. And in the afternoon, we're going to transition to talking about the potential paths forward for the state. Uh, but before we do that, we wanted to open the floor for a panel discussion on the biggest challenges facing California groundwater and um, basically the state of the resource. So um, we'll invite anyone who wants to ask a question to line up. We have a microphone on either side at the front of the room. So um, you can go ahead and start lining up now with your questions. I can get things going uh, with a question while you guys are all, I can see you're all rushing to the microphone. So you can start standing and walking and I'll ask the first one. Um, so I guess I I'll direct this one at Bridget. Um, we, we heard a lot about the impacts of climate change on surface water with snowpack and runoff. And in your opinion, what do you think are the biggest um, challenges for groundwater with respect to changing climate? Um, I, I guess uh, my feeling is... got to push. Yeah. You need to keep it on, is it? Uh, I don't know, try to... No, you're going to have to hold it down. Okay. Um, I guess the biggest issue, uh, I think, as uh, many of the speakers mentioned this morning, is uh, demand management. And uh, I think we need to consider uh, the um, indirect impacts of uh, uh, climate change on uh, water demand, uh, especially for irrigated agriculture. Um, in many semi-arid regions, they talk about uh, uh, potential evapotranspiration increasing with the increasing temperature. Uh, but uh, if there is no water to evapotranspire in dry areas, it may not impact uh, the hydrologic cycle that much. But in irrigated areas, when you're trying to um, reach uh, potential ET by irrigation application, then it would increase irrigation water demand. And so I think we need to consider indirect impacts um, on, on water demand, I think. Great, thank you. Um, so, all right, you can go ahead, James. Hi, my name is James Farland. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah, a, and please just introduce yourself first. Sorry. I'm <laughs> a third year student, actually part of CWAS. One, my question is directed towards uh, Mr. Slater. Scott, a lot of what we heard about today is focused on ag, and we heard about ag again, but what about environmental flows, especially in the legal framework of like the Endangered Species Act? So as these systems that may be groundwater dependent, I'm thinking um, like the Owens Valley pupfish, as they become endangered, how does that impact the legal framework and what we're able to do in terms of water management? I think you have to hold it down. Just keep it down. Go. Okay. Uh, so, look, uh, the, I think the first thing is, is that, that uh, we, we don't have a case yet that expressly says that uh, safe yield as defined and undesirable results include, quote, environmental impacts, unquote. Uh, but nonetheless, I submit to you, it's impossible to rationally read the definition out of San Fernando and the other cases that employ the definition of safe yield and conclude that it doesn't. I mean, I, I, I would hate to defend that. There, there's a, of course, there's a question of materiality, and there's a question of what real impact is, and those are embedded in that definition. But I don't think that you can, I don't think you can read that definition to say it's only pertinent to consumptive water uses and impact on, on other users or somehow uh, physical manifestations. So that, that, that would be my first point. And the second thing is, you know, the Endangered Species Act does apply to groundwater, right? So there's no immunity from the Endangered Species Act because somebody's taking groundwater. So if the, the impact of an action has an imp uh, has a, 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 the consequence of a taking, then that action is going to be subject to application of the Endangered Species Act. So I think it, it is a, it is a, a, a pragmatic constraint from a water planning standpoint. People should think about uh, the environmental consequences of establishing a safe field on a basin by basin basis. I don't think there's any way to avoid it. Great. Um, go to the other side of the room. Uh, yes, Andy Fisher from UC Santa Cruz. I had a, a question for Dr. Moat having to do with, with regional climate modeling. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that microphone is on. Uh, I'll speak up. I, I had a question for Dr. Moat with respect to regional climate modeling. So um, recent observational work is showing that there's a, there's a big effect in precipitation patterns in terms of storm intensity. Um, nobody mentioned that today, but even if the average is the same, if more of the rain falls during a smaller number of events, we're going to get spikier runoff and a lot less opportunity for recharge to occur, for example. And one challenge for the models has been that the representation of the mesoscale processes that contribute to you know, the, the shapes of storms and their intensity aren't, haven't been well represented. 
so I'm curious where that's going right now, because I think in terms of evaluating impacts, if we just look at the annual precip, it's not really telling the story. And the map for California might show that the annual isn't going to change much. And we could still get half or a third the recharge because of changes in intensity. And until the, so I'm wondering where the models are in, in really giving us a look at what intensity of precipitation is going to be like on those scenarios 20, 30, 40 years out. Thank you. I think eventually we'll learn we have to push the button down and hold it. Um, I'm going to put Norm on the spot <laughs> because he's a real regional climate modeler. I just, I just dabble. Um, it's certainly true that global models are way too drizzly, uh, so even their representation of the past is pretty useless. But Norm, you want to answer yeah. the question? Um, so we finished a couple papers using CMIP3 results. Um, Those are global models the... from about... 2005 to Yeah, six but era. these came out these came out in 2011, 2012 and another one 2014 with Dave Pierce. Um, myself, the Santa Cruz group, um, our group up at Berkeley. Um, and what we show um, through the statistical analysis is that during uh, the winter period, the northern tier of California gets um, a clear increase in intense precipitation events along the lines of Clausius Clapeyron's relationship that states, more or less, if you see a one degree Celsius increase in warming, the carrying capacity in the atmosphere of water vapor increases by about 7%. And that 7% redistributes water vapor in a way that when it rains heavy, it really rains heavy. And when it doesn't rain, it, it doesn't rain. So the rich get richer, the poor get poorer is the general uh, story that um, people hold on to, especially um, some of the people at um, 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 GFDL and other locations would say. Um, so the upshot really is the wintertime precipitation on a very short synoptic scale does become more intense in the winter. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was from global modeling, or did you? Uh, uh, it was, a, it was regional um, models. We used three in models. regional models, okay. WARF, um, the Reg CM and the regional spectral model downscaled for um, two sets of projection scenarios for the mid-century as well as um, um, BCSD and, and the um, BCCA, um, which is, it stands for bias corrected um, statistical downstairing and bias corrected um, 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 analogs. I, um, I forgot what that C stands analogs. for canonical analogs. And what they do is they really um, provide um, the, the statistical downstanding doesn't capture the higher moments, but it does um, show that the dynamic downscaling sits inside of the um, uncertainty envelope, if you will, of the statistical projections for precip. Um, but you don't get the annual, you, we get the six hour out of that. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> I'm, I'm Ken Verisov from the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences on campus. Um, I have a very, very basic question. Uh, if we did a word cloud of all of the talks, I think that after water, the second most common word used was sustainable. And I have sort of a three-part question. Is sustainability anything more than a mythical and unattainable goal? Um, are there any systems that anybody could cite that have had long-term, where we can demonstrate long-term sustainable water yields? And sustainability implies stasis, that is, fixed conditions through time. We're living in a period of enormous climate change and other changes. Does sustainability really mean anything in that context? Any takers? <laughs> okay, I push the button. <laughs> uh, to, to be shot down. Uh, look, I, so so first, um, question one was, uh, does sustain uh, sustainability? Is it anything more right? than a, a mythical and, goal? An and un, uh, goal? I, I don't know that it's anything more than mythical. In, in the context of of what you do in a courtroom. Uh, what is sustain? People want to ch chat about it, cite it, argue it, but I can't 
point to a case or a standard which converts that into anything objective and meaningful to meaningfully applied. Uh, in, in the context of groundwater, I think a surrogate for that is largely considered to be safe yield, right? And, you know, and some people would prefer the term perennial yield, and I'm not going to get into that debate because I've spent enough time in the geologic text to, to figure that. But it basically means safe, sustainable, perennial are all kind of within the penumbra of each other. And, and if you look at it in that context, it is largely, in the groundwater context, it's largely what is rechargeable, right? Largely tethered to recharge. But as I suggested earlier, it would be a great misfortune for everybody to take that as the litmus test or to have some sort of sole recharge based evaluation of what is sustainable because I'm going to make this brief notation. The great, one of the great things about being an American is our ability to innovate and creatively manage solutions. And and in every instance, the application of creativity can lead to optimization. And it may be in instances where you, there are instances where it makes sense to take more than the recharge rate or to take less than the recharge rate. So that would be the first point. The, the last point, which, which is, uh, makes me also bullish on the notion of um, sort of a consensual management structure that is, that is sustainable one day or safe field one day is influenced by cultural, social, economic conditions that exist in a given area. And one cannot say uh, in perpetuity that conditions are gonna prevail, things change. And, one, and it's true, every time we set out a, a course to predictably manage what the future is going to bring, we're wrong. Uh, and it's only a function of how long until we're proven wrong. And, and so what you need is a structure that can manage divergence from the plan and then have a mousetrap in place to bring that back into the, into the framework. And consequently, I'm again less a fan of politics and more a fan of innovation within a structure and by the way, people working together in a, by contract. I, I actually, I, I believe in that. Uh, in, that, in that structure. And the second question was? Oh, and he, well, second, one, second part was a, an example of a long-term sustained well, yield. Uh, from yeah, so uh, there are instances in which uh, people have made promises based upon future or expected innovation, right? So, uh, and, I'll, and I'll use an example what I'm very familiar with, and, and that is what I, a model, in my opinion, of successful long-term, successful 15 years, of successful uh, sustainable management, safe field management, is the Chino Basin down in, in the Inland Empire. It straddles three counties, and they've done a wonderful job. That was a facilitated solution. They, if you don't know, they were, on the, they were an adjudicated area that was on the precipice of disaster, very acrimonious. There was a court order to disband the water master and send up management to the Department of Water Resources. And under the threat of losing control over their water, they sat down and over a nine month period hammered out what they called the peace agreement. And since that in 2000, hundreds of thousands of acre feet are pumped, stored, transferred without any form of litigation and stored within this basin. And it's been, it's been terrific, but there's, there was a consensual basis to say that to the extent that we are, we're gonna bet on further innovation. So to the extent that there is a shortage, we're gonna cure the shortage by contributions, financial, effectively. We'll rely on our local markets, but we'll do whatever it takes. And if it means shutting down, it means shutting down, but it's the last resort. An example of, of largely farmer-based, uh, all local supply is the Santa Paula adjudication, which was done consensually uh, among predominantly 90% of the production, or probably, I'm sorry, 80% of the production is agriculturally based uh, in the Santa Clara River, and Santa Paula's between the Oxnard Plain on the one end and Fillmore and, and, and New Hall on the other. And they have managed that pretty successfully on local supplies, without overdraft, without conflict, for since 1994. Thank you. Do we have another one on the other side? No, I think. 
I think maybe she Oh, sorry, did you want to add something? Go ahead. Okay, well, one of the things to think about with sustainable is that uh, you want to think about sustainable for who and for what and for how long. And if you trace that notion of sustainability, both generally and with respect to groundwater, you see that uh, initially we thought about safe yield and gradually uh, there's a great paper by Calvin Woolley that talks about this shifting uh, definition to from safe yield to sustainable yield, uh, recognizing that it's a very social decision what is sustainable. In other words, where you're going to draw the level of an unacceptable impact, which you mentioned, uh, but that in itself is a very socially determined uh, term. Uh, so that both makes it something that uh, probably does need to change over time, uh, also complicated and uh, we think that it's important to sort of lay out what your assumptions are about what sustainable is. Uh, the Brundtland Report, which kind of brought that term out into the international uh, view, uh, talked about future generations. So uh, it's possible that 15 years maybe isn't quite long enough to sort of see that long-term impact, but the idea that uh, that you sustain things over a long period of time. And there was a great, uh, I use this for my class, uh, Edith Weiss talked about uh, making sure that options for future generations are there, that the quality of your resource is there, uh, and your opportunities are there uh, for the resource. So people have tried to come to grips with it. I think it's much harder to put a numerical term, which is what uh, water practitioners have to do. Okay, well, what, how are we gonna define that for our basin? Um, um, I would like to second what uh, Scott mentioned, you know, that um, uh, we need to consider how we can adapt, I mean, and, and limiting it to recharge is, I think, too restrictive. Uh, for example, you look at the North China Plain, they've been depleting it, but now they have the South-North water transfer, and uh, maybe that will allow them uh, to replenish uh, some of the aquifer storage and, and bring it back uh, uh, sort of like the uh, North to South in the Central Valley. Um, so we need to consider time scales and, and future. And then also when we're trying to figure out water scarcity issues, there's a lot of emphasis on hot spots of depletion which is the Central Valley, the High Plains, and uh, North China Plain. But there are a lot of humid regions where there, there's not overdraft or things like that. Um, and so uh, adaptation, uh, resilience, and, and things in the future. And then um, how much water do we have available? If we're looking at scarcity in terms of demand exceeding supply, how do we estimate uh, how much groundwater is available uh, to be used? Uh, for example, in Texas, we don't have uh, subsidence issues like you do in the Central Valley. And um, in a lot of places, uh, we've already disconnected surface water and groundwater. So why, you know, why should we, so, uh, so big impacts wouldn't be there in terms of environmental, so maybe they can deplete, um, you know, deep confined aquifers or, or use them more, much more than recharge. Thank you. All right, let's move on to the next question. Yeah, I'm Steve Baker, Operation Unite. Uh, just a tag on what you guys are just talking about. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Committee did come up with a definition for sustainability, which included, the only part I remember is uh, maintain a capacity to adapt. So in agreement with what you're saying there. I don't remember the rest of it, but plenty of people on iPads in this room. So go ahead and Google it. My question is for Scott. Scott, I hear a lot about what's going to solve our problems here in California will be recycling and reuse. Well, from a water rights standpoint, and in water rights we talk a lot about taking water, uh, we're taking water one time and then we keep recycling it and reusing it. We never give it back. That doesn't play out very well in the, in the water rights world, I would think. So if you could comment on that, and also who, who owns the water, or the rainwater today, and who will own, or not own, but manage the rainwater uh, 10 years from now? Thanks. Okay. Uh, so the, the subject of, I'm going to make this um, lay friendly. The, the, the subject of recycling and reuse is a derivative of the notion of, uh, in the water rights context, called salvage. 
And uh, a party who uses water has the, the right and the ability to employ, before they surrender dominion and control, before they lose it, they have the right to become more efficient in their use. And, and that is a, a black letter proposition that's basically salvage. And, and yet it is also, and one, has, one who has a right to use water has the right to engage in salvage so long as they've not lost it or given it, turned it back into the stream or into the groundwater basin. And yes, there are some exceptions to the rule, but I'm gonna leave the exceptions aside. So the basic rule is, yeah, you can salvage. And you own the right to your, the water that you salvage. So to the extent that you're taking an inefficient operation and becoming more efficient with that operation, then you're fine. There is, however, also a law called the law of return flows, which says that, that effectively when someone's downstream or enjoys, enjoys a, uh, a right to use water and they've historically relied on your less than optimal efficiency, should we say it that way? If they've in, in enjoyed a right to your less than optimal efficiency, your improvement in efficiency that deprives them of their water is not permitted. That's not permitted because you are cutting off their right to use water, which just gets us in into, there's a whole, about an hour part of a law school class on, um, on what I call the social contract of a water right holder. The, the, the water right holder takes a water right and they agree to you, that for the benefit of getting the property right, they agree to use it reasonably and efficiently within the custom standard and habit of an industry or, or as established standard. So your use has to be north of the standard, you can't be south of the standard. And it is true that a, a downstream or a competing user can't rely on you continuing to be inefficient below the standard, right? So, so if, you, if you implement efficiency improvements to bring you to the standard, that probably is gonna be be yours to recapture as the salvaging partner. If you take it above that standard, you're probably at risk to depriving someone else of their historic recharge or source of, source of water, and you have a limitation. That's about as general as I can make it. Thank you. Take the next one over here. Hi, um, you guys have all done a really nice job of addressing issues related to valley aquifers. Um, I'm Rachel Durbin from Sierra Streams Institute in Nevada City, which is in the foothills. What, if anything, can you address with um, regards to our fractured bedrock aquifers that we've got up there and the difference in um, influence on groundwater usage and regulation considering we're upstream of a lot of these major agricultural areas and potentially expected to feel the effects of climate change a little bit more since we're having that snowpack turn into rain events. So I'll start with the legal. Okay. Yeah, all right. And then the others can hit the hammer, the, the, the technical. Uh, I don't think, I think a management zone is a management zone. So if you, if you defined uh, with integrity the hydrologic unit, whether it be fractured bedrock or something else, uh, you can establish management parameters on a geographic hydrogeologic basis. Uh, I think the, the problems tend to be, uh, I was having a conversation during the break, there are two kinds of problems. There are basin, there are more than two kinds of, there are two common types of problems. One is basin balance which has to do with the overall supply availability and overusing the supply on a global cumulative basis within an aquifer system. And then there are localized conditions which pertain to the method that an individual or a group of people are taking water within the aquifer system. And so in a bedrock system, it can be where someone, um, albeit unintended, produces water in such a way that has impacts that are unexpected and deprive someone of, of their access to water, which is catastrophic, right? So uh, there needs to be a, a more localized set of conditions and rules that pertain to taking water in a bedrock because of the of formation, because of the consequences of effectively knocking someone out of access to water. You know, it seems similar to the situation in Pajaro, where you have uh, inland pumpers and coastal pumpers, and uh, they don't see the groundwater situation as the same. Uh, but there isn't any rule that prevents 
upland uh, that allows or prevents upland uh, pumpers from taking less to allow for less saltwater intrusion on the coast. I think Graham Fogg, as a student, is going to be studying that. <laughs> right, Kate? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Thanks. Don't have anyone over there, so I'm just stay on the side. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on the storage or your, your earlier comment about the salvage. You said that the first right to water is the overlying property owner to pump it out. What about the right if you collected a bunch of uh, ag users in an in a isolated basin like Sonoma Valley, Santa Rosa Plain? And they said, gee, we'd like to store, we'd like to do ASR on our property. We're a large catchment area, a couple thousand acres, what have you. Would we have the same right to put it in uh, during storm events that we have to pull it out, assuming for the time being that we filtered it? The point is, if we collectively as large landowners felt the need to store in order to get it later, Right? Do we have that right in the same context that we have the right to pump uh, when nobody has measured it? I, I, I can hear my managing partner and compliance officer with a big uh, two by four. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, look, this is an educational setting. And so, so aside from the specifics of the, the project that you're, that you're talking about, um, water is, uh, and I, and I realize now I didn't answer the question about who owns the rainwater. There's actually, there's actually a statute which says that, that uh, no one owns the benefits from cloud seeding and, and rainwater is sort of rainwater until it, it lands on the ground and then it follows a, a, a legal regimen or categorization. When it's open and diffused and not part of a known and defined channel, it's essentially available. It's available, and if it's if it's deemed to be native, uh, native water as opposed to foreign or imported, native water is subject to claim by everybody who's an overlying landowner for reasonable and beneficial use. And if some group of landowners got together and they tried to do a project which deprived a portion of the landowners of their reasonable share of the recharge, the people who are on the outside probably have a claim against people who are trying to intensify their recharge because their historic form of, of percolation has been interfered with. And this is actually a real problem in, in, in a place that I'm thinking of. Um, however, uh, if the water would not percolate but for the action of this aggregate group, it would not join the basin, it would not become available, then there's an argument to be made that the water uh, was not part of the native claim. It was beyond the, the, the water which would historically per percolate and is available to be appropriated. Now, one then has to decide whether the water being appropriated is water that's subject to our friends at the State Water Resources Control Board, depending on its point of capture, or whether or not it was diffused water which was not and otherwise available. Does that make sense? All right, let's take the next question. I'm uh, Scott Warner, uh, principal hydrogeologist with Environ. And like Scott, I'm second generation Californian. And uh, my father-in-law is actually a retired farmer and rancher. So I get all that stuff. Um, thank you all very much for the conversation. It, it probably goes without saying that you know, California, by all all scales is, is one of the top 10 economies in the world and by itself and one of the most important economies to the country. Uh, it probably also goes without saying that one of the reasons the, the growth of California in that fashion uh, became so is because of the ability to distribute water to, for all kinds of reasons. So we have this, this um, very complicated matrix between environment, water, industry, economy. So I'd like to be, and we know that unabated industrial growth is not necessarily a good thing because of some of the issues that uh, can come from that and from growing up in Los Angeles where the adage was on a clear day you can see across the street in the 70s, <clears throat> we, we know why. So in the, kind of an open-ended 
question for the panel. How do we um, promote a better communication, maybe education, to show that good water is important for a good economy, a good economy is important for a good environment, and because we're a consumer-driven world, for better or for worse, we need to make sure that all this works together, right? Protection of water is good for the economy. A good economy is good for protection of water and distribution, et cetera, even with all the technical, you know, within this technical constraint that, that we're all within. So a little bit open-ended, but I'll leave it to you to help solve that for us. Any takers? Ruth, are you no, smiling? It's complicated. <laughs> no. It'd be hard to simplify that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't address that question directly, but I mean, what I would like to say is that uh, oftentimes we have focused on technical aspects of water issues and then socioeconomic factors and stuff like that. And so uh, now I think with this Iger group and other uh, efforts like that, we're trying to bring those two together and better understand, uh, uh, have a more comprehensive understanding of the issues and, uh, and then develop approaches to deal with it uh, that considers all those things. Um. Uh, I, have, I have one uh, observation, which is that, that uh, there is just now, just recently, last like 12 months, uh, in my opinion, there is an emerging point of view that is trying to articulate what the social and economic, social, what the social slash economic value of water is and what the social and economic cost is of going without. And, and it is easy for people, far easier for people to talk in the abstract about depletion from storage and technical things without understanding what the corresponding consequence is of going without. And, and likewise, if you, if you're too long at the trough, and that's a, if you take too much, there's also a consequence that, and somehow we have to figure out a way to distill messages to make them simpler so that people can understand that where, where there is a drought and there's water rationing, economies are constricting and contracting because there are missed opportunities. There are things that aren't happening that put people to work. And that's bad. And yet taking too much can hurt the environment that we all live in and want to enjoy. And I don't know what the answer is, but simpler, clearer messages would be helpful. So, so simpler than my uh, question, of course. I would also like <laughs> to add that it not only hurts the environment, but it hurts individual farmers and urban areas when you have a drought, for example, and you have not uh, allowed for that condition, uh, and then you suffer economic consequences. So you have to factor that in as well. I think. Uh, sometimes I think a question like that, rather than with uh, glittering generalities, it's almost better to start to look at individual case studies to really pin down some of the key points and then expand out and see if you can make uh, some more general uh, ways of thinking about it, because uh, it is a complex question. One, one follow-up on that. Should there be more of a national dialogue because of um, the, the situation, the water situation in California? Wow, I'm gonna, I, this one I'm opinionated on, uh, as if I wasn't on the other ones. Uh, I've sat on a number of uh, panels about a national water policy, and we do have a national water policy. And the national water policy is we defer to the states. And there's been like 200 years of rationale that uh, behind the fact that we don't want, uh, here I'm going to hit them again, the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., telling people in California how to balance their, their social and economic and cultural needs. I'm not in favor of politicizing and creating a, a national oversight over water. Now, in some instances, guess what? We had to do it, right? Water quality, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act. We got to a place where we were, we were at standards in some places that cried out for, for federal oversight. We're not there yet in water and in groundwater. I'd like to, I'd like to believe that we have the ability 
to avoid a federal oversight. Bridget, I'm not an economist, but um, I do respect the work of economists, and the economics of water are just fascinating. You know, it has widely varying prices depending on where it is and, the, and even when it is, and, and that to a large extent reflects the economic contribution that water makes. Um, you know, so a gallon of drinking water in a, a, a city that's experiencing a drought um, can be, you know, thousands of times what it is for untreated water in a, or I suppose you could even argue that water has a negative value when there's flooding um, because it's ca causing damage rather than, <laughs> than benefit. Um, but, you know, the, the other lesson is that, you know, there's an elasticity of demand for water. Price rises, you get less consumption. And, and so in, in a way, I would challenge your, your thesis that um, water scarcity poses a threat to California's economy because I think um, municipalities all the way up to DWR have shown great flexibility in how to respond to water shortages in ways that um, may diminish economic productivity. A farmer may switch crops to something that requires less water, but um, I don't think I don't think this 2014 drought is going to send California into a recession. That's just, you know, again, I'm not an economist, but I wish there was one up here. Um, I'd like to add something about the locus of authority question. Uh, when the Clean Water Act came into being, uh, it was recognized that there was a huge diversity of river systems and water systems throughout the country, and so and that the states already had a certain amount of uh, acknowledged authority over water. Uh, but it was deemed important to try to set some standards at the federal level, and it was done so that the states then were required to implement uh, standards any way they wanted, but if they did not rise to those standards, then uh, the federal government could step in. And it's been suggested uh, that we think about uh, groundwater that way as well, possibly, that the state uh, would think about certain standards, whether it's uh, standards for overdraft or withdrawal. Uh, I'm not sure how, how it would be done, but, uh, you know, the precise sort of a method, uh, but that locals would be free to implement uh, those standards and uh, where there were uh, reluctant uh, or areas that were having problems doing this, that the state could... Uh, step in and, and let them know that they really needed to move on this. Uh, that's been proposed by a number of people. So. Um, okay, so Thank last you. thoughts from Bridget, and then I think we've got time for two more questions, so if you want to just wrap this up. I, I just have one, one comment. I mean, a drought is a temporary thing. You know, it can last three, five years more. And, uh, uh, you know, we've seen from Australia where they've built a number of desal plants to uh, uh, provide water during their millennium drought, and now many of them are mothballed. So uh, that's uh, something I hope that economists uh, will look into. I mean, um, it, do, it oftentimes ends in a flood, so I think we need to better manage these extremes, and storage is one way. Great, thanks. All right, so let's, um, we can have two more questions, so go over here. Uh, good morning. My name is Peter Kavunas. I'm with the Chino Basin Water Master's Office. Thinking about uh, climate change and uh, groundwater, um, the, the basic message is it is getting warmer. We're going to have more runoff, less snowpack, and we're going to use groundwater basins as storage. So what I'd like to ask for some thoughts from the panel. Um, are there any studies that you know of that have looked at how much more storage do we need? Any studies about do we have existing surface water systems that can convey that extra water that we would have earlier into existing groundwater basins? Uh, who owns the storage? That's a gratuitous question for Scott. Uh, who owns the storage where that water could be placed into? And could groundwater basins be used as a, as a uh, broader public resource in the way that surface water systems uh, storage has been uh, funded and used by California uh, since the beginning of our state. Uh, and what other impediments are there, like groundwater contamination, uh, including uh, increasing salt loads, and what uh, barriers do those provide for our ability as a state to adapt and respond to climate change? 
there are individual agencies that are looking at uh, storage and trying to do some of those calculations. Uh, as far as who owns the storage, um, I think there's still a little bit of flux in that uh, issue, but my understanding, and I'm hoping Scott will step in if I'm uh, to, to add, uh, is that the storage is a, a storage in an aquifer is a public space, but that individuals can uh, get a right, much the way you get a water right to use water, you don't actually own that water, uh, and uh, you can get a right to use that storage. Uh, and I believe that was a West Basin decision. Yeah, on the rifle shot question of, of who owns the storage, I, I think the safest answer is that, that uh, it is subject to adjudication. So it is within the jurisdiction of the courts who are adjudicating water rights to allocate storage. And, and most of, I, I, I'm not familiar with every piece pleading that's out there, but most of the adjudications now that are moving contemplate who owns the storage and who can store and establishes rules, which is the key issue. I don't think anybody, sorry. I don't want to say anybody. I think the prevailing view is landowners do not control the storage space under the Cory Crossman frigate from the, surf to the, from, the, from the center of the earth to the, the atmosphere. It's basically appropriable space comparable to uh, the river channels. You know, one can commingle water in a, in a natural channel and remove it from a natural channel. And if that's true for a river, it's presumed to be true for under our percolating groundwater space. So I think the prevailing view is it's going to be subject to uh, control and regulation and the adjudications are moving to make that available. Uh, I, I would just add that this is a completely different way of framing the question, but um, uh, I'm racking my brain trying to come up with the numbers but, uh, for California, but I know in the Northwest, 30% of the annual flow in the Columbia can be stored in reservoirs. And um, that means that the, the whole system relies very heavily on, on snowpack as, as storage. And we sketched out a number of years ago how, how much above ground built storage would be needed to offset a 20% decrease in spring snowpack. And it's comparable to you know, a couple of major new projects. Uh, the one major new project that's been proposed in the last 15 years, BlackRock in uh, the Yakima Valley, uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, did an economic analysis and concluded that it would return 16 cents on the dollar. Uh, and that was with generous assumptions about people who would go boating there who weren't already going boating at the reservoir 20 miles away. Um, so, you know, just from an economic standpoint, uh, as well as an environmental standpoint, um, the magnitude of challenge of replacing that lost snowpack is so great that surface storage alone, whether it's large projects or off, you know, impoundment ponds, high elevation or whatever, um, that alone will not solve the problem. Now, groundwater in some basins may, may be part of the answer. Okay. So, thought from uh, Bridget. Just uh, if, I, if I can, I, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make is that, okay, so we need all this extra storage. Do we have enough groundwater uh, capacity to store it? And are there barriers that are insurmountable? If, if storage can be adjudicated, then are we really talking about a regional resource or are we talking about something that the locals are going to get because they happen to overlie a basin and not share it with anybody else? Um, and I'm also curious if there's any studies that show if you had unfettered access to store all that water, can you physically percolate it into the basins uh, as, it's, as it's running off the mountains? I, I was actually impressed by some of the, uh, the complexities of whether you're actually going to get it in the ground, you perk it, and use it. Uh, and so there are complexities. But if you look around and, and sort of the, I actually had this discussion in Australia, which is how to turn a negative into a positive, right? So on one hand, you can look at the historic practices in California and say, okay, we, we depleted storage. Well, we actually created storage, right? So, so now if you, if you push water underground and, and you avoid, and you put a system together that has integrity, uh, you avoid evaporative losses that are associated with surface reservoirs. You avoid the environmental damage. Yes, there's the, the overlay of, do you have mobilization of contamination? You have portability issues. Can, where, do you, sorry, where do you put the, the wells to be able to, to return it? What are the losses associated? But everything I've seen, A, 
is that groundwater storage is more environmentally benign and more efficient than putting water in, in surface storage. And do we have capacity? My God, look at the Central Valley, right? But what we're missing is the overarching architecture to ensure for people that if they put water in the ground, that it will actually be pumped out by the people who intend to recover the storage as opposed to having it taken by farmer A, B, or C. I guess I'd just like to add one point. I think um, Claudia Font has been including uh, managed aquifer recharge in her regional Central Valley hydrologic model recently and looking at some of these issues. And one of the things may be if they use those spreading basins that they may be recharging the shallow aquifer above confining layers, but they may be pumping from the confined aquifer. And so that shallow uh, increase in storage may be just discharging to streams. And, and so they're still depleting, maybe depleting the more regional, deeper aqua system. So that's something that uh, would need to be considered. Okay, great. So um, I think we're actually out of time for more questions. Sorry, that one's a long one. Um, but there'll be more time for discussion a lot in the afternoon. It's pretty much all discussion and we have more breaks. Um, so just to conclude the panel, um, we're just wondering if all of you could transition us to the afternoon where we're gonna be talking about paths forward with uh, just any succinct thoughts you have on what are the most promising uh, innovations you see coming for, coming for the future. You can just go down the line if you want. Okay. Um, I guess uh, what I uh, saw was a common uh, thing that m many speakers mentioned this morning was demand side management. And I think uh, we need to consider that more and more in the future rather than always focusing on the supply side. I think in, in looking at uh, what various agencies are doing around the state, I, I was definitely impressed uh, both with our case studies and uh, with other areas that, uh, that I've looked at, at how particularly in urban areas there's been a real move to get a handle on uh, all their resources to manage them uh, more wisely, to try to get away from uh, a total reliance on imported water and see what they can uh, do to develop uh, local water supplies. Uh, I think everybody can read the writing on the wall that we're going to get some form of state groundwater legislation th this year, and and it's and my hope is that it will be the kind of legislation that facilitates what makes us best, and that is innovation. While it may set standards for for things we must do that the discretion to do that is it, it, it first blush given to the local stakeholders to be able to sort their affairs out and, uh, and that the state allows that to happen. Well, going last, I guess I'll have to take a different tack, which is that the state of California is leading the way politically, economically, socially, and in other ways in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's had um, historically one of the lowest rates of carbon dioxide production per unit uh, gross state product. Um, and it's also now uh, the home of one of the coolest automobiles ever built, the Tesla Model S, which I got to test drive a couple of weeks ago. And if I were as well paid as my detractors claim, I could actually buy one. <laughs> All right, so Tara, did you wanna make some comments before? Great, so I just want to thank you all so much for your input and, and great ideas.